Winter. It's too early to talk about winter. Oh my God. We really don't want to think about ice and snow or driving on ice and snow or in, you know, in that regard, anything to do with getting a driver's license and learning how to drive on snow and ice. But this is what I want to talk to you tonight. I want to get this message out there to all the people, all the new drivers that are thinking about postponing their license until next spring. Don't do that. And I will give you reasons why you should take your driver's test in the winter time. The payback, the return on investment is super, super high. So we're talking about winter driving. We're talking about learning to drive in the winter time. And we're talking about getting a driver's test and not postponing your license until next spring. Please do not do that. Please go and get your license. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a long haul truck driver in the 1990s. Crazy to think that, that was almost 30 years ago now. It's at least 25 years ago. I, start, I stopped driving in the early 2000s. So it's been a, been a long time since I drove truck, but uh, licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. I am a, a driving instructor in the province of Ontario in Canada, British Columbia, and as well in Victoria, Australia. I was, uh, went to university there in Australia and earned my doctorate in legal history in 2006. While I was going to university, I drove buses for Greyhound, one of the regional bus lines there, so I have coach experience as well. And if you want to know more about me and about the Smart Drive Test uh, online presence, uh, you can learn more about that with the auto, uh, my autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. That link is down in the description. New videos this week, uh, easier driving tests, the reasons why you should take your driving test in the wintertime. And if you want more information about taking your driver's test in the wintertime, have a look at Willie's videos. This is his fourth driving lesson. He took his driver's uh, lessons in the wintertime on snow and ice and passed his driver's test first time. He did really well. Uh, him and I had about four or five lessons together and uh, he learned heaps and passed his driver's test first time in the wintertime. Did exceptionally well uh, on his driver's test. Okay, slipping and sliding and this is the fear that a lot of people have. That they're not going to have control of their vehicle. Uh, if you have good quality tires on your vehicle, most vehicles in this, stage are, in this day and age are all front wheel drive all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. There's very, very few vehicles anymore that have two-wheel drive, unless you're driving your dad's hot rod, uh, which probably won't be driving in the wintertime. So most cars, even with questionable tires on them, are still going to have good traction because of the uh, traction control and the configuration of the drivetrain on the vehicle. All right. In the winter time, you are going to become a safer, smarter driver with a higher skill set. You are going to have a, a greater understanding of the, of the primary controls, the steering wheel, the accelerator, and the brake. And you're going to understand traction better. When it's a little bit slippery and you're taking off from the intersection, you're going to learn how to feather the throttle. Because if you step on that throttle, you're going to get oversteered. The back end of the vehicle is going to kick out and go one side or the other. And then you're going to have to take your foot off the throttle and then feather into it again to get it going. So you're going to have a higher skill set by learning how to drive in the winter time. Okay, don't be left out in the cold. Don't wait until next spring to take your driver's test. Okay, that's a long ways away. That's six to eight months away. If there is a blizzard, if the roads are bad, authorities are going to postpone your driver's test. They're not going to take you out in a blizzard. They know that you don't have a, 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 a high skill set and they're not going to risk their own safety, okay? Don't listen to the rhetoric of what everybody else says because I will tell you right now from running polls here on YouTube on the, on the YouTube channel and the community tab, people are terrified. <laughs> of driving in the winter on snow and ice. They're more terrified of driving in the winter time on snow and ice than of driving in a hurricane, which is coming to Atlantic Canada this weekend. They're more terrified of, of, of driving on snow and ice than driving in a forest fire. And they're more terrified of driving in on snow and ice than they are of being in a tornado. Uh, you know, snow and ice is not going to kill you if you're driving accordingly and put the tips and techniques in place that you need to, to have to, to be safe. Tornadoes, hurricanes, and forest fires are probably going to do damage. Uh, maybe they might even be fatal. But I think I would take the driving on snow and ice over any one of those other three things. 
Okay, know that you can drive in, in adverse weather conditions and dress for the winter time. Have good boots, coats, and those types of things. But of course, when you're learning how to drive, take the big coats off and that sort of thing so that it's, it's more comfortable and you have better control of the vehicle when you're driving. Uh, in the winter time, the test is not exact. For example, when you parallel park, you don't have to be six to eight inches from the curb. You only have to get in behind the vehicle in front of you because for whatever reason, driving examiners do not like pushing cars out of the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you get stuck, they're just going to get out of the car and go back to the DMV. They're not going to wait for you. All right, uh, when parking in the parking lot, and this, of course, is the, the caveat to this is, is that roads are snow covered and you can't see the lines on the roadway. Uh, when parking in the parking lot, you just have to park beside the car next to you. You don't have to get in between the lines. And finally, uh, you don't have to stop at the correct stopping position at controlled intersections. You just have to come up and stop before the sidewalk and then creep out until you can see. And when the way is clear, then you can proceed. The other piece about it is, is most of the roads are going to be clear. All the main roads are going to be well maintained and salted and sanded. <clears throat> it's going to be a not quite as good when you get into the residential roads and those types of things. But most of your test, 80% of your test is going to take place on the main roads. It's not going to take place in the residential parts. So know that. Okay, what's between you and Oblivion? Uh, your snow tires, here you go. Here is the image, that what I was talking about, M&S or the mountain snowflake symbol. That's what you need on your tires to be good to go in the winter time. Now, if you're driving up to the ski hill or you're in the mountains on hard pack, uh, hard pack is uh, ice and snow that they simply can't clear off the road and it won't melt. Uh, so you're basically driving on hard pack, which is ice and snow, and you might want to consider steel studded tires. Now that's something that your parents are going to fit your vehicle with. So you're not going to have to worry about it too much. The other piece about it is you want to make sure that your tires are properly inflated. Most modern vehicles after 2010 are all going to have uh, tire pressure monitoring systems on them. So you're not going to have to worry about uh, pressure on the vehicle too much. Okay, if you do feel the vehicle start to slip and slide a little bit, you need to get off the brake. You need to get off the throttle, uh, the accelerator, and you need to steer the vehicle. Focus on steering the vehicle in the direction that you want to go. Okay, move out of the main ruts of the roadway. And I was reading a Twitter post today about wintertime driving and they're saying drive in the tracks of the other vehicles. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. And the other reason that I don't necessarily agree with that is because of A, first of all, it forces you to look down at the roadway and you don't want your vision looking down. You want your vision looking far down the roadway. So you don't want to be doing that. The other piece is, is I find that that can be misleading because not necessarily other traffic is going to go where you want to go. And I tend to drive out of the tracks, not in the tracks of other vehicles. Secondary controls. Yes, this is going to be part of your higher skill set in the wintertime. You're going to have to know how to use the wiper fluid, the windshield wipers, and the defrost and heater controls in the wintertime to keep the glass clear so that you can see. So at minimum in the wintertime, you want to be able to know how to turn on the headlights, use the wipers and the washer fluid, and you want to know how to work the defrost and heater controls so that you can stay warm, keep the glass clear while you're driving. All right, you gotta get her stopped, drive for the conditions of the road, stay back, have a good following distance from the vehicles in front of you, brake early where you want to stop, don't try and stop where you're gonna stop, slow down, stop back from where you're gonna stop, and then creep up to where you wanna stop. Okay, and again, if you lose control of the vehicle, get off the brake, get off the throttle, and steer the vehicle in the direction that you want to go. You got to do the work, okay? Work, do the work in the pilot with the pylons in the parking lot. I cannot stress that enough due to the fact slow speed maneuvers are to driving what scales are to music. They're what drills are to sports. It's 20% in and 80% out you will improve your learning exponentially by doing some work in the parking lots, focusing on your parallel parking, focusing on backing into a parking space and doing your three point turns. This is all going to make your overall driving so much better. All right, learn to drive in the winter. You're gonna have a higher skill set. Driving examiners are more relaxed. They're probably gonna be a little bit more lenient. They're gonna give you kudos for taking your driver's test in the winter time. 
you're going to get a test date because for some places here in British Columbia and other places, it's two or three months off for a driver's test. You're going to get a driver's test date. Okay, the test is less less exact in the winter time on snow covered roads. For example, you don't have to parallel park six to eight inches from the curb. You just have to get in behind the the car in front of you. Okay, and the roads will be fine. The main roads are all salted and sanded and clear. 80% of your driver's test is going to take place on main roads. It's not going to take place in the back roads and the residential. It's going to be a little more slippery and, sli and icy there, but know that you can go slower on the residential roads because conditions are compromised. So take your driver's test in the winter time. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Emily, question how imperative it is that I get winter tires that currently have all season. Uh, Emily, we're going to talk about that a little bit during the live stream. However, it's not crucial to get winter tires. Uh, most uh, all-season tires now have either the snowflake symbol or the mountain symbol, mountain snowflake symbol. If you have those on your tires, you're going to be fine for driving in the winter time. Now, winter time, of course, it's not under ideal conditions because speed limits are designed for ideal conditions. When roads are dry, you have good traction. In the winter time, it's not going to be ideal conditions. So you're going to increase your following distance and you're going to start to brake earlier. The other key piece uh, or key technique for the winter time is that you're going to slow down back from the intersection where you actually want to stop and then you're going to creep up to where you want to get stop because intersections tend to be more slippery than other sections of the roadway and that's because the cars are coming up they're braking the tires are skidding with friction we get heat melts the ice and snow a little bit and you get this layer of water this nice layer of water on top of the ice and snow and that's what makes the ice slippery so you're going to break back from where you actually want to get stopped. Uh, Nelmic, uh, with months during winter, should we schedule our test? Uh, anytime that you can get a driver's test. The other piece about winter time is because there's fewer people taking their driver's test. All the goofy people are staying home. <laughs> so there's less people on the roadways, less vulnerable road users, uh, kids on e-scooters, skateboards, those types of things, uh, less cyclists and whatnot. So you can, uh, you know, take your Anytime you can get a road a driver's test. I know that in some places, I know here in British Columbia, there's a long wait for a driver's test. In other places, big cities, New York City, Texas, and those types of things, uh, it's going to be easier for you to get a driver's test during the winter months. Uh, Mike, going for my class three with air brakes, uh, is the IB, ICBC knowledge test hard? Uh, it's not hard, Mike, but for the commercial learner's license and the air brakes, Particularly the air brakes, if you, you've probably already taken the course. Uh, if you've taken the course, the air brakes isn't too bad, but I would suggest that you try and do as many practice driving tests that you can get, you can find, and that's going to help you out because the it's a skill to be able to answer the practice driving tests, and I'll talk more about that after the presentation. Uh, Emily, I'll have to go and check my tires. I've also got all wheel drive, so it shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, no, you're probably going to be all right, Emily. Uh, you know, I only recommend people get snow tires if they're driving in the mountains up and down to the ski hill every day, those types of things, you know, you're putting a lot of miles in your car, but if you're mostly staying in the city and you're not driving out on the highways and whatnot, then all season tires are going to serve you well. Now, we do have mountain passes. We do have, Quebec has a snow tire law in effect. Uh, other places have snow tire lights, uh, laws now in effect. But if you have all season tires on your vehicle that do in fact have the mountain snowflake symbol or the S, uh, M and S on the tires, I was gonna say S and M, it's not S and M, it's <laughs> M and S, mud and snow on your tires, then you're good to go for the winter time. All right, uh, Ross and hey Rick, I was wondering if you could make a video on how to drive in both the rain and at night. Uh, yes, I can, Ross, and I've already done that for you. Corey will put up those two videos for you on how to drive in the rain and how to drive at night, okay? That'll help you out. Uh, Mallory, you must have been away getting a, a drink or something because they did say hi to you and asked you how the weather there was in the Maritimes, my friend. Uh, Evan, uh, I can figure out that the reason for hatched markings between 
and freeways traffic has tried to merge too soon, they'll impede traffic because they haven't reached the speed limit. Yes, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is, Evan, that you're in the danger zone of hitting a concrete median. That's the reason for the hash marks there. Uh, Eric, uh, not sure what you're asking. How are the kids doing in school? Uh, Eric, my daughter is going to high school this year, so she's getting, you know, we're transitioning to a new building, new rules, and new teachers, and those types of things. So that's been uh, good fun, and uh, I'm learning how to do math in French, uh, which is a bit of a challenge, you know, trying to help my daughter with her math and whatnot. Uh, now, my guy, I've heard some people on the highway tests uh, get docked for not speeding up a bit uh, when switching to the left lane. Uh, yes, now, Mick, anytime that you want to change lanes, you need to speed up a little bit because now you're going on an angle and to compensate for that angle and greater distance that you're traveling in your vehicle, you need to speed up a little bit. I'm not talking about great acceleration, but I'm talking about uh, accelerating a little bit. And if you look, uh, Corey will put the video for you on changing lanes and that will help you out with that uh, maneuver and getting it right and getting your speed accordingly. Uh, Ross and I'm a good driver. Ross and you and everybody else uh, driving a car believes that they are, in fact, a good driver. Uh, that is one of the things that unites us as a human race, re regardless of creed, uh, religion, politics, uh, whatever our belief system is. Every one of us all believes that we are good drivers. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Queen, uh, I'm supposed to do parallel parking between two cars and have two examiners assigned to me. Uh, Queen, where are you taking your driver's test that you have two driving examiners? Is one on probationary? Are they a probationary examiner? Is that what's going on? Uh, Mallory, we're expecting a hurricane this weekend out here. Uh, hurricane Lee. Oh, yes, I heard that that was heading towards Atlantic Canada. Uh, I wish you well. <laughs> Sending you good energy that that's not going to happen this weekend there uh, in on the Maritimes. Bottle, I hate it so much when I'm approaching a stale green light and I don't know if it's going to turn red. Uh, those are getting easier, Bottle, uh, in terms of approaching green lights that may turn. Uh, you now have countdown timers on a lot of these uh, traffic lights at intersections, so that definitely helps a lot. The other piece is that can help you in terms of knowing whether the light is going to change or not is uh, pedestrians, are there pedestrians standing at the corners of the intersection or have they already crossed? If you look at the cross traffic and you see the traffic really backed up, then there's a good chance that light could change on you because the traffic has been sitting there for a while, which means that the other light has been, green, uh, has been red for a while and your light has been green for a period of time. And that's another uh, symbol. And also, as some driving instructors say, any light that you didn't see turn green. But yeah, that doesn't really help you out in terms of uh, traits and characteristics that you're looking to identify to figure out whether the light is going to turn on you and change to yellow, okay? So those are some of the tips and strategies you can use. Uh, Nelmic, do you prefer 45 degree reverse parking or 90? Uh, Nelmic, I try and do 45 when I can. 90 is pretty tough because you're trying to, you know, you got to turn the vehicle sharper and you got, it's a, there's a lot more variables going on with the 90 degree. My friend Klaus, how are you, my friend? I did see your comment earlier. I was going to say something and you posted it again. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, it's kind of busy. So if you post a comment and I don't get to you, just post it again and then I'll come back to you and I'll make sure that I get an answer to your question uh, that you're posting there. Uh, Ross, and the reason why we turned our headlights on when it's snowing or raining is because we want other drivers to see us. Yes, and that's a great point, Ross, and this is becoming more of an issue with automatic headlights because hot automatic headlights do not go on full when it's raining or overcast, which is something that we need to do. So if you can think about this when it's raining or it's snowing, Turn your windshield, your headlights rather, from auto on to on, and that way you activate the taillights on the back of your vehicle, and other traffic can see you uh, when it's overcast or it's not ideal conditions for driving. And this is, you know, technology makes us lazy, right? <laughs> and, you know, I have talked to different drivers who said, I'm not going to turn my headlights on. I'm not going to turn them on. Even if it's going to mean keeping you safer. Uh, I would encourage you to turn your headlights to the on position so that you can be seen by other traffic because remember, driving is a social activity and it 
and to, to keep yourself out of trouble and not have a crash is a matter of you working with everybody else in the, in the system and that other people can see you and having your taillights on is going to keep you safer uh, when you're driving in overcast, rain and snow and those types of conditions. Uh, Nelmic, yes, 45, there's less stops for sure. Uh, Marion, what's it like driving in snow? Uh, Marion, it's, you know, it's no different than driving in rain. I mean, if you keep the, you know, you keep, you have the appropriate speed, keep your vehicle in a straight line, uh, you're gonna be fine. People get into trouble when driving in snow, when they change directions of the vehicle, that's when they get into trouble. When they go around curves, corners, and turns, that's when they get into trouble because their speed is too high for going around curves, corners, and turns. As long as you're going in a straight line, you're fine. It's when people hit a bit of snow and ice. And here's a perfect example of that. A couple, three years ago, and I'll see if I can find the video for you. It's on my, it's on my, it's in the archives there somewhere. Uh, Highway 97 North, 97C going to Kamloops, and I was heading down to Vancouver Island. It was one night I I thought I remembered a vehicle being in front of me going down the road, but I'm bombing down the road, and of course I'm doing uh, I'm doing 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, and I just you know in a straight line it was fine, but just as I went around a corner. I felt the back end start to come around and I'm like, I'm going too fast. And sure enough, around in three circles, we went <laughs> backed into the ditch and the, and you know, the buggy stopped. I was like, oh, that happened. But you know, I was lucky because there weren't any other cars on the roadway, but it was as soon as the vehicle went out of line, as soon as the back end started to go around the corner a little bit, I was on snow and ice and I was going too fast. That's when I lost control of the vehicle. But again, if you get into that situation where it starts to lose control, Get your foot off the throttle, get your foot off the brake, and just concentrate on steering the vehicle. And sometimes you're going to have to steer like a crazy person. The other piece about that is make sure you have your seatbelt on. Because your seatbelt's not just in the event of a crash. Your seatbelt is to keep you in the seat. Okay? Because if you're not in the driver's seat, it's pretty tough to drive the car. <laughs> That's the other purpose for your seatbelt is to keep you in the seat. Outdoor fishing, uh, just wondering how can I determine whether it's safe or not to go through a yellow light? Isn't there like a point of no return or something like that? Uh, outdoor, yes, there is definitely a point of no return. If you are one vehicle length from the stop line at the intersection, you can't stop, you gotta go through. However, if you're farther back than one vehicle length, then you gotta try and bring the vehicle to a stop. Now, for the purposes of a driver's test, for those of you going for a driver's test, you may find getting stopped at a yellow light might be pretty aggressive, okay? You might have to really get on the brakes to get it going, okay? Uh, outdoor fishing, no, nope, not a big deal. Uh, you know, it was my own fault. Uh, I was going too fast is essentially what happened. I was going too fast on the roadway. So, you know, and as soon as the vehicle went out of line, I knew that, that it was going to lose control. And... Uh, it's not the first time it's happened. You know, if you drive long enough and you drive in the wintertime, eventually you're going to lose control of your vehicle. Now, nine times out of 10, eight times out of 10, you're going to be just fine. Okay. Uh, you know, never, never drive faster than your guardian angels can fly. That's, that's the rule of driving, right? Uh, Marion, I have a seatbelt alarm system, and if I don't wear my seatbelt, it yells at me. Ha ha. Yeah, most cars do. Uh, Marion, I was, there's a video here on driving an SUV, how to drive an SUV and drive a larger vehicle. Uh, I think it was a 2017 Honda Pilot that uh, the Honda dealership let me use here. And uh, <laughs> I was in the parking lot, and I'm working, uh, I can't remember her name now, uh, but. Uh, we're in the parking lot and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get going with the car and you know, we're just in the parking lot and I, it was a push button transmission. I pushed it into drive and I'm like, man, it wouldn't go. And I pushed it again. And I'm like, what the heck is going on with this car? And of course she comes over to the window and she's chuckling away and she looks at me and she goes, you have to put your seatbelt on. So the newer cars, like the really newer cars within the last five years, if you don't put your seatbelt on, it won't even go into gear to be able to drive the vehicle. So talk about, you know, the car telling you what to do. 
Uh, Carrie, my friend, how are you? Uh, if the road is icy, I know you need to drive slower than the speed limit. What is the best way to know how much slower than one should be driving? Okay, Carrie and everybody else who has questions about driving in the wintertime, believe me you. This is the one time that I will tell you in the wintertime that the speed you should be going is the speed that everybody else is going. Okay, that's the only time I'm ever going to tell you that. <laughs> because when the roads are bad, and it's snowy, and it's icy, everybody else will be driving in a big line at a slower rate of speed than the posted speed limit, all right? And I can, I can put up all kinds of videos for you on that. So the only difference, that, the only thing different that you should be doing than everybody else who's driving on the roadway slowly is you should have three times the amount of distance between you and the vehicle in front of you. Don't be like everybody else who's like a train of cars going down the road and they're like one after the other, one after the other, because if something happens, it's gonna be like dominoes and everybody's gonna go in the ditch. All right, so just go the speed that everybody else is going because I promise you that everybody else will be going slow uh, when there's ice and snow on the roadway and it's slippery. Uh, Night Sports, can you tell us three secrets that can help us pass the driver's test the exactly new to, uh, need to focus on? All right, excellent question, excellent question. What do you need to absolutely focus on for your driver's test, okay? Listen to the uh, instructions of the examiner, okay? Don't get freaked out. This is, this is an overview first. This is not number one. Okay, just listen. They're going to give you good instructions and they're going to give you those well in advance. So number one, shoulder checking. Shoulder check every time you change directions of the vehicle. That is a must. Okay, that is number one. Shoulder check, shoulder check. The direction that you're going in the vehicle, minimum two times every time you change directions of the vehicle. Shoulder checking. The Number two is space management you have to have that space in front of your vehicle and two to three second following distance when you're following other traffic driving in a straight line and when you stop at intersections you need to be back approximately one vehicle length your landmark for that is to be able to see the tires in front of you making clear contact with the pavement all right and then number three is stopping at the correct stopping positions at controlled intersections and giving way to other road users. So mapping and tracking other road users at intersections. All right. So the three stopping positions at stop sign intersections before the stop line, before the crosswalk, or at the edge of the intersection if the, two, uh, if the first two conditions don't exist. No stop line, no crosswalk lines or sidewalks, okay? Note that some intersections will not have crosswalk lines on the, on the street. They'll just have a sidewalk, so you got to stop before that sidewalk. So those are the top three. Shoulder checks, space management in front, and then stopping at the correct stopping position at stop sign inter or controlled intersections, and mapping and tracking road users, other road users, and giving way to those other road users and knowing the right-of-way rules. Okay, Those are your number three. And remember, if you're the least in doubt, stop. Wait till the, the uh, traffic situation changes and then proceed. Uh, scroll back up through the comments here. Corey put the video up for you on pasture driver's test first time. Have a look at that. There's uh, three videos I would suggest. Automatic fails, common mistakes on a driver's test, and unexpected events on a driver's test. Have a look at those three videos and that'll help and ensure that you pass your driver's test first time. Uh, now, Mick, there are times I accidentally look at the kilometers instead of miles per hour. <laughs> yes, if you have a car that's been in Canada or other places in the world, it's going to have kilometers and miles per hour. Uh, Marion, I understand how you feel. I would go along the quieter roads first, get used to how the car feels, and then go out on the major roads uh, when it's quieter as in the mid-morning and just afternoon. Yes, that is good technique if you're learning how to drive to get used to the vehicle and get used to other road users. Uh, Ross, in question, when a driving a manual transmission, when you're stopping, do you apply the brake first or the clutch first? Uh, Ross, and it depends how fast you're going, usually you're going to apply the brake first. You're only going to push in the clutch if you're coming to a complete stop and the tachometer gets down to 1,000 RPMs. Now, I know that there is the odd person out there has a manual transmission that does not have a tachometer in it. A tachometer tells you how fast the engine is going, all right? Gasoline engines will idle at 900 RPM and they will run anywhere between 
a thousand RPM and six thousand RPMs. But let me tell you, if you're six thousand RPMs on a gasoline engine, you are really gassing on it. You are really <laughs> pedal to the metal kind of thing. If you have a diesel engine in your car, it's going to idle at six hundred RPM and it's going to run anywhere between a thousand RPM and maybe three thousand RPM. But three thousand RPM is a lot for a small diesel engine. Okay, uh, so when you come up to brake on a gasoline engine, the tachometer is going to get to go a thousand RPM and then you're going to push the clutch in, come to a complete stop. Now on a diesel engine, you're probably going to let it, you could let it get down to probably 800 and then you would push the clutch in and then bring the vehicle to a stop. Uh, so yeah, you're definitely going to brake first. Epic, my friend, also in the winter time, you might as well carry a winter uh, driving emergency kit just in case you get stuck in the snow. Uh, in Suffolk County, cyclists died from an emergency vehicle, full speed green. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, no, I was look, going through my dash cam footage that I've been saving for over a year now, and it's been way overdue in terms of going through and vetting that video. Uh, there was a, an emergency vehicle that just like screamed through an intersection. I mean, usually they're very careful about going through intersections. You know, they come up, they kind of slow down, they make sure that everybody is stopped in the intersection and then they proceed through. But every now and again, you get an unfortunate situation like that where the emergency vehicle just like careens through the intersection and uh, somebody unfortunately gets hurt. Uh, Mallory, what does RPM mean? Sorry, uh, RPM is revolutions per minute. So how many times the engine spins per minute? So it's going to turn 3,000 RPMs, 3,000 revolutions per minute uh, is pretty average for a, a gasoline engine in a, in a motor car. Okay, sometimes it's going to be less than that. It's going to be 2,800 or 1,700. depends on the vehicle and the configuration of the engine and the transmission. But that's what RPMs means, revolutions per minute. Uh, Ross, and have you visited Ohio before? Uh, Ross, and yes, I spent a lot of time driving in Ohio when I drove truck there in the 1990s. But I'm sure it's changed a lot uh, since I've been there, for sure. Uh, green, uh, how often should you check your rear view mirror while driving? I find myself not checking it so much, but I've also been, uh, rear ended in construction zone due to the driver speeding behind me. Yes. So you should be checking your center mirror, your rear view mirror once every 15, you know, kind of 10 to 20 seconds as a rule and being very aware and having that situational awareness of where other vehicles are around you. And the other piece about that is keep space in front of your vehicle. And if you're looking in the center mirror and you're going through a construction zone and you see somebody come screaming up behind you, you have that space in front that you can move up to try and prevent that person from rear ending you behind. As well, you can start pumping the brake pedal and that's going to flash your brake lights on the back end there, which is going to give uh, you a bit more time and try and get the attention of the person behind you uh, when you're driving. Uh, excellent. Okay. Thank you for that boost there, Marion. Awesome. So we're talking about driving, passing your driver's test in the winter time, taking your driver's test in the winter time. And I know most of you are thinking, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? It's crazy. It's beautiful outside. I'm still going to the beach, but <laughs> it's only going to be six or eight weeks and it's going to be cold. And we're going to start seeing frost and we're going to start seeing ice and those types of things. And I know that many of you are getting back into school. You're busy, uh, you know, transition. By that point, you're going to have uh, midterms uh, and you're just not going to be thinking about getting a driver's test. And you're just going to say, oh, my God, I don't need it. I live in the city. I've got good public transit. My parents drive me every place that I need to be. But it's going to be easier to get your driver's test in the wintertime and it's going to be easier to pass your driver's test. So don't postpone it for six to eight months until next year. Get your driver's test in the wintertime. Book your driver's test now for January, February, March. That way you're gonna get a driver's test date. You're gonna get a higher skill set when you're learning how to drive. Examiners are more relaxed in the wintertime and you can go out there and do your driver's test. They're gonna be a little bit more lenient as I said, the driving test, the slow speed maneuvers are not as precise in the winter time because you just have to get in behind the vehicle behind in front of you when you're parallel parking, for example. I mean, if it's bad in the winter time and there's a lot of snow, there's been a big accumulation of snow and those types of things. I'm not talking about like super bad. I'm talking about in the winter time that if there has been an accumulation of snow, 
they may not even get you to parallel park. They can just say, hey, you know, you can drive. Obviously, you're doing really well. You're stopping at the intersections. You're scanning well. You have good control of the vehicle. They might not even get you to parallel park. So when you do park in the parking lot, you have only have to park in beside the vehicle beside you. You don't have to park in between the lines. Uh, if the roads are snow covered, you don't have to come to a complete you don't have to stop at the correct stopping position at the intersection. You just have to stop before the sidewalk and then creep out until you can see and proceed when the way is clear. Easier, easier driving test in the wintertime and you're going to have a higher skill set. Most of the time the roads are going to be clear. As I said, all the main roads have been salted and sanded. It's when you get into the residential areas that it's going to be a little bit more snow and ice. But most of the test, 80% of the test, takes place on the main roads. So know that. Don't freak out. As well, all cars, most cars in this day and age are front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, or four-wheel drive. So if you've got decent tires on your vehicle, you're going to have good traction. Uh, Gavin, Corey will put up the videos with Gavin. Gavin took his driver's test in February, and him and I were learning how to drive and the tires on his aunt's SUV were questionable at best. And there was a couple of times we went around a corner, I'm like, oh, those, those are a little dicey. And I got out of the car and I put my hand down on the tires and I was like, oh, those are like right down to the wear bars. So the, the, the SUV needed new tires, but because it was an all wheel drive vehicle, he still had good traction on the roadways and he was still able to learn how to drive. But if you watch the videos with Gavin, most of the time, the roadways are clear. There's no problem at all. Uh, elevator fan, I heard that you got rear-ended. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, what was the situation that you got tailgated, my friend? But you're okay. You're here, obviously. So any crash that you can walk away from is a good crash. And I'm happy to hear that you're okay. Uh, Rawson, would you lose points for not checking your mirrors? Uh, Rawson, yes, you will. If you're not checking your mirrors every 8 to 10 seconds, you're... Are, eight to 15 seconds, you're going to lose points uh, over the course of your license. So know that, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, outdoor, uh, there's a full year, there's no shortcuts. No, um, Klaus, uh, usually we don't have snow before December. Uh, Rear-ended. Oh, you were tailgated. Sorry, I thought you were rear-ended there. I, I didn't read it as well as I should have. You were tailgated. Okay, so again, to prevent being tailgated or you know by other drivers, just increase your space in front, and that way you can drive for you and you can drive for the other person who's being goofy and tailgating you, okay? And I'm going to do some videos on that. I've got some really good stuff tailgating <laughs> other drivers and whatnot, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, Epic, in some cases during the winter time, they can cancel your road test if you live in a state that requires a road test fee and it gets canceled due to a snowstorm, they will refund you or pay your fee again. Yes. Uh, most of the time, Epic, what they're going to do is they're just going to postpone your driver's test. They're, they're not going to give you your money back unless it's canceled, but they'll postpone it. They'll just move it to another date is what they're going to do if roads are bad or there's a blizzard or those types of things uh, in the wintertime when you're taking your driver's test. Uh, Eric, how bad are fees if you are ticketed after speeding through construction zone? Are there stiff penalties for speeding? Uh, Eric, most places, construction zones, if you're speeding in a construction zone when workers are present, and that's kind of the caveat is, is that workers are present, fines are doubled. So if you would normally get a $145 speeding ticket, now it's going to be, what is my math? $295, $290 is if you get 145 and it's doubled. So most of the time, uh, fines in construction zones after you get, after you start driving, you're going to be doubled in construction zones. Uh, how fast, 22, how fast is a shoulder check? And is it a quick glance like checking your mirrors? Yes, it is 22. So you're going to check to the left, your right, my left. It's just like that. It's just a quick 90 degree head check, okay? And the reason that you're doing the head check is, is that you're looking for light and movement in your blind area because you can't see into that blind area unless you move your head. And if there is something there, a cyclist or a pedestrian or an e-scooter or whatever, then you can look again and you're like, oh, okay, there's an e-scooter there, right? But you're gonna quick head check. You're gonna get make sure you've got your space in front. And if you do see something there, then you're gonna be like, oh, okay. Because 
The reason it's only 90 degrees, because I know that there are some instructors and some examiners that erroneously tell you that it's like this, it's, it's not like that, okay? We, in a healthy adult, our peripheral vision is 180 degrees. If you put your hands out here, you can see your hands moving at 180 degrees. And when you move your head 90 degrees, now it's 180 degrees this way. So that's what it is, just 100 and, or 90 degrees head turn in the direction that you're going. Uh, elevator fans, see you next week, my friend. Have a great dinner. Uh, okay, now i yes, two shoulder checks. Uh, Klaus, if I, I were in the state of North Hendon, I would rare seeing snow or a driving test. <laughs> yes, there are places where you would go. Uh, for example, if you are in the United States and you are south of the Mason-Dixon line, it's unlikely that you're going to say snow in, in the wintertime. And if you are in, say, South Carolina, for example, or North Carolina, for that fact, and they get snow in the wintertime, they basically shut the state down. They just go home. Okay, if there's any snow, if there's a skiff of snow on the, on the road in the wintertime in North Carolina, they just go home. They don't even stick around. <laughs> yeah, so know that. Uh, all right. Terry, uh, two-way stops on a busy road. If you are in the car across from you or both turning left, uh, you should go first uh, once there's finally a large enough gap to go. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're at a two-way stop. It depends on who arrived first. But okay, let me just back up there on the two-way stop. Now I've got it visualized in my head. Carrie, if you're both at a two-way stop and you're both turning left, you can both turn left at the same time. So you're going to turn left and they're going to turn left. So you're basically going like this. So you can both turn left at the same time at a two-way stop. All right. Uh, outdoor, one time someone on the opposite side of traffic drifted into my lane and I had, hadn't honked. It would have likely been a head-on collision. Yeah, anything that you can do to walk away from those is going to be great. Uh, my friend Big Mac Sam is here. Hello, my friend Big Mac Sam there in the Bronx. How are you, my friend? Always, always awesome to see you. Uh, Mallory, today my family and I saw a school bus that was broke down on the side of the road and had its uh, safety cones both sides of the buses. Awesome. That's great to see that they had their safety cones out because usually what commercial drivers do if they break down is they usually call dispatch and they're like, hey, I'm broken down. Can you can send somebody out to get me? And then five minutes later, the mechanic or the diesel technician calls you on the phone and they ex ex ask you what's going on and what the symptoms of the vehicle are and those types of things. You have a discussion with them. So 10, 15, 20 minutes later, you've talked to everybody that you need to talk to to get the vehicle fixed or get it towed or whatnot. And uh, then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm still sitting here. Uh, yeah, I need something to do. So then they go and dig the triangles out. If the triangles are even there, you know, because most people do not do a proper pre-trip inspection on the vehicle and they don't check the safety gear, the five F's, the uh, first aid kit, the flares, the flashlight, the fluids, and I'm missing one, the fire extinguisher. You know, not, they don't check any of that stuff every day. It's just, you know, go around, kick the tires, make sure the lights are working kind of thing. So they get out on the side of the road and uh, then they, you know, after 20 minutes of talking to everybody else to either get the bus towed or get it fixed, then they're like, oh, well, maybe I'll go out and throw the triangles out the back. And they go out the back of the bus and then they fire them down the road as far as they can throw them, right? <laughs> so that's how that happens. Uh, snapshot, am I right when I'm changing lanes? If the car in my side mirror is in the top half of the mirror, there is enough space for me to change lanes. Yes, okay, but you still want a shoulder check to make sure and double check that there is in fact enough space there. And before changing lanes, minimum three flashes of the signal before you start moving over, okay? That's what you need. And the reason that we have three flashes on the signal before we start moving over when we're changing lanes is the first one gets the other driver's road user's attention. The second one allows them to locate you and the third one allows them to take some sort of action that's going to help you out. Either they're gonna slow down and create space for you so you can move over, <clears throat> or they're gonna speed up and get past you so that you can move into that space. Many new drivers are like, oh my God, that driver is so rude. Did you see that person? They just like sped up past me. I just hate them. If the person speeds up when you're trying to change lanes, they're doing you a favor. 
<laughs> they're not being aggressive and they, they didn't take some instant dislike to you. They're just like, oh, the person has their signal on. They want to move over here. I'm already halfway up the car. I'll just speed up and go past them. They are doing you a favor when they're speeding up and going past you, okay? So don't get your nose all out of joint, your knickers in a bunch. Uh, when you put your signal on to change lanes and the person beside you speeds up to go past, okay? It's not a big deal, okay? Don't take it personally. They're actually doing you a favor and getting out of your way and creating a space so that you can change lanes safely and move into that space, all right? Uh, outdoor, I like your sense of humor too, Rick. <laughs> Thank you, Outdoor. Well, I've been doing this a long time and you know, you gotta make it funny. You gotta make it humorous. Uh, Mary and I thought it was uh, if both front lights of the car and the other lane, it was far enough back so you can change lanes. Uh, no, essentially the mirror, it kind of needs to be in the top third of the mirror and then you have enough space to move over into the other lane. Again, have a look at the changing lane video, but that's basically what you need. But again, to double check and triple check that in fact you do have enough space to move over, then you shoulder check and make sure that you can move over into that into that lane, okay? <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, just run a YouTube channel. You'll see people with their knickers in a bunch. There's no, oh my God, people, people really get upset. Uh, now, Mike, do we look at the driver's side window and the back right passenger window when shoulder checking? No. Now, Mike, it's 90 degrees, okay? 90 degrees in the direction that you're looking because peripheral vision is 180 degrees, okay? We can see here. I can see my hands moving when I do this. And we're turning, and now it's 180 degrees this way, all right? Someone even uh, braked on the highway one time because they missed their exit. Uh, I had to slow down from 100 kilometers an hour to 40 kilometers, so I didn't hit them. Yes, and I've got some good video footage of that as well, of people just like careening across three lanes of traffic to get into their exit. Keep in mind, the saying goes, good drivers sometimes miss their exit. Bad drivers never miss their exit. All right, that's the way the saying goes. Those of us who are good at driving <laughs> sometimes miss our exit. We're like, oh, okay, that's not safe. I'm not going to try and pull that off. Whereas bad drivers will just careen across three or four lanes of traffic and take their exit and risking everybody else and, you know, their safety and crashing and those types of things. So know that, okay? The saying goes, good drivers sometimes miss their exit. Bad drivers never miss their exit. Uh, Mallory, the broken down school bus was eventually towed away by a tow truck. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, Big Mac Sam, that's my specialty. Yes, it is. All right. And John, you just got your five-hour certificate. Congratulations. Yes, that's what Sam does. That is his specialty indeed is doing that five-hour certificate. So congratulations on that. Uh, Klaus, I have a good tip for some people, a breaking emergency hammer in the car. Uh, this tool may be, uh, save lives one day to help you escape the vehicle. Yes, indeed. Uh, the other one, uh, I don't know that whether a lot of people carry pocket knives or those types of things anymore, but I have seen in the movies, I don't know whether it happens in real life or not. I, I really, maybe somebody, one of the smart drivers out there or somebody else can give me some information on this. How often post crash, like after the crash and the, and the people, the occupants are trying to get out of the vehicle, uh, maybe firefighters would be able to tell us this information. How, how often is it that you can't get the seatbelt unclipped, right? How often do you actually have to cut the belt to be able to get out of the vehicle? So uh, that tool that Klaus is talking about may double as, you know, being able to break the glass in the vehicle, but also having a knife so that you can cut the seatbelt because I mean, you know, if the car rolls over and you're hanging upside down, there's all that pressure on the seatbelt and on the clip where it snaps in, uh, can you actually get up and reach that to be able to get the seatbelt undone so that you can actually get out of the vehicle? You know, cause it does a great job at saving you and those types of things. <laughs> in the end, are you like hanging upside down going, okay, now how do I get out of here? So maybe somebody can, Give me that information because I don't know. Uh, food story. Uh, do you trust t Tesla Autopilot? Uh, food story. Absolutely not. No, never. <laughs> I would not. I would not. I uh, food, sto food story. I would actually trust 
lane assist and automative or um, adaptive cruise, cruise control more than I would trust the Tesla autopilot. Okay, we are just not ready for that in any stretch of the imagination, especially now that we've had a few crashes because they mixed up the side of a white semi truck and they just drove into the side of that white semi truck. No, there is no way on any planet that I would trust that. Marion, I have a tool in the car that cuts the seatbelt and breaks the window. Okay, there you go. So there is, it does double as that. Sheldon, my friend, how are you? Uh, John, I totally agree that you, that taking your driving test during the winter time, awesome. I'm glad that you do. Do take your driver's test in the winter time that this is what this live stream is all about and helping you pass your driver's test and be a safer, smarter driver. So take it in the winter time and you're going to pass. It's going to be an easier test. Uh, now, Mike, I'd rather continue learning how to drive than co uh, consider myself a master at it. Awesome. Uh, Eric, I find it a bit challenging to do serpentine backwards. How far should the cones be set? 20 or 30 feet? Yeah, about uh, four car lengths, three or four car lengths. That'll help you out to be able to do that serpentine backwards, that reverse figure eight. If you can do that reverse figure eight, you're doing really well with your ability to handle the primary controls on the vehicle, the steering wheel and the throttle and the brake. Yeah, you're you're up there. You're a champion. Uh, Eric, I find it a bit challenging to do serpentine backwards. Okay, I already answered that question. Awesome. Uh, 22, what ways can I learn how to drive without being behind the wheel? 22, it's pretty tough to learn how to drive when you're not behind the wheel. I mean, you can look at YouTube videos. I mean, that's what I do. Uh, you can, if you have access to a car, you can just go and sit in the car and, uh, you know, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the secondary controls and those types of things. Uh, you can definitely have a look at YouTube videos. Uh, I have had people say to me that if you have a video game and you have a steering wheel and the, the brake and the accelerator set up on your video game, that will help you as well. But really when it comes right down to it in terms of learning how to drive and being a safer smarter driver getting in the vehicle and actually having behind the wheel seat time is one of the only ways that you're really going to learn how to drive uh ross and i know that all new vehicles have electric parking brakes uh ross and you are correct however i would if i was teaching you how to drive i would get you in the habit of applying the parking brake every time you park the vehicle because you're going to drive a lot of different vehicles over the course of your life. Not all vehicles are going to have electric parking brakes in them. I mean, they're super nice and it's another piece of technology. We were talking about technology earlier in the live stream with automatic headlights in rain and snow and other uh, overcast conditions. You have to turn your headlights on to the on position so that you activate your taillights so that other, v other, other drivers and road users can see you because... In overcast conditions, your taillights aren't on when it's on auto, and therefore it's not as, you know, you're not as visible and not as safe. Uh, Marion, Stryker doing after his snip snip. Oh, Marion, he was basically down for half a day, and then it was like nothing happened. And uh, he's not here today because, uh, as you know, as some of you know, we're leaving for Australia in 10 days. So he's already gone on his holiday and he's already off. So yeah, no, he was basically down for half a day. And then after that, you wouldn't even have known. And he, he recovered great. Uh, the surgery went well. Uh, they gave me some anti-inflammatories and uh, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> he got his, he got his snip snip. All right. Uh, Klaus, the problem is you can't stop about two meters behind a car. If you lane will be looking like a Y. Okay. Not sure what that's about, but anyway, all right, uh, yeah, so the 23rd of September, we're going to Australia. So if you have any suggestions about videos you'd like me to shoot when I'm in Australia, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I know some that I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to definitely do a video on right-hand drive cars because people think it's such a mystery, but it's actually, it's not a mystery at all. Everything's actually in the same place, uh, except the steering wheel is on the other side of the car. So that's kind of fun. Uh, 22, how can you understand interstates and highway signs? Uh, 22, there's a video here on the channel. You can have a look at that and that will give you all the information about you, uh, how to navigate uh, interstate systems there in the US. 
Yes, Big, Z Big Mac Sam, taking the two kids to Australia, and I haven't been back in 17 years, so it's going to be just magic to see my friends again uh, going to Australia. So we're going to Australia the first three days. Uh, we're driving from Sydney to Victoria. We're going to a place called Hall's Gap, which is near Ballarat. And uh, we're going to stay, and we rented a cabin for three days, so we're going to stay with my one set of friends <clears throat> in Hall's Gap. Uh, that's about an 11-hour dri drive from Sydney, and then we're going to drive back to Melbourne, which is about three and a half hours, and then we're going to stay with my other friends uh, the weekend, uh, and they live in the western suburbs of Melbourne. For those of you who don't know what the western suburbs are, uh, east of the Yarra River and west of the Yarra River, and they're west of the Yarra River, and it's called the western suburbs and uh, in Altona. So we're going to stay with them. And uh, it was interesting because when I left Australia in 2006, uh, we all had kids about the same time. So our kids are all the same age. So that'll be just great fun. I'm just so excited about uh, going back to Australia and, and uh, taking my kids and, and, and seeing them. So we're going to do a lot of videos about driving. I ordered a new dash cam today. I have one with a front and rear camera now. And, uh, so, and it's supposed to be 4K as opposed to my Garmin camera, which is 1080. It's not even 1080 as far as I'm concerned. It's more like a kind of a high 480. <laughs> I've never been happy uh, with the video on my Garmin dash cam, unfortunately. So I'm really crossing my fingers that uh, the new dash cam is going to be 4K and it's going to be just so much better qu uh, video quality than the dash cam that I've been using. So uh, Cario, Australia sounds amazing. Hope you and your kids have a wonderful time. Thank you for that. Yes, I am super excited about it. I'm super excited about shooting videos there and sharing all of that with smart drivers here on the channel because Australia is just such a fantastic place. And uh, I've got some ideas uh, as well. So, uh, you know, about changing the videos a little bit and uh, making them more interesting. So we're going to try that. Uh, Nalmic, are you also going to New Zealand? Nalmic, no, I'm not going to New Zealand. Uh, just, you may or may not know this. Uh, uh, New Zealand is a five-hour plane ride from Australia. I've been from Australia to New Zealand before. I went to an academic conference there. And it is a big plane ride to New Zealand. So, yeah, we're not going to New Zealand. We're just going to Australia for 16 days. Uh, four days of travel, so it's you know a little less than two weeks, but it's just going to be really awesome. Sam, I can't wait to see the quality of your new camera. Yeah, I'll let you know for sure, and I'm going to do uh, um, a review on it. So, yes. So tonight, take your driver's test in the winter time. Easier driver's test. Driving examiners are relaxed. The test is not as exact. The roads are going to be clear, and if they're not, they're going to postpone your test. So definitely take your driver's test in the winter time. Don't postpone it for six to eight months. Wait till next and wait till next year. Take it in the winter time. Thank you, everybody, for the great questions. Thank you for the uh, wishes for the trip there in Australia, and uh, we will see you next week. And remember, oh wait, I forgot. If you had your test in the last couple of weeks and passed your driver's test. Congratulations on passing your driver's test. And if you have a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.